Well, as you can see, I found this homeless guy underneath the bridge, so I brought him along today. He says his name is Swanee. There's some rumor that I've been guiding this guy for 40 years. Unsuccessfully, too, man. <laughs> My only failure. A couple things about today. I'm strictly opposed to filming when I have a hangover. I'm going to make an exception today. We are going to be completely on foot today. We're using this. We're trying to pretend like we're not in a boat because we'll be completely waiting. We're going to try to show a lot of water types. We're going to try to show a lot of setups, angles, things like that. For when, you know, for those of us who live in boats, we kind of get the idea that everybody does. And in reality, a lot more people wade fish than they do boat fish. So we're going to try to set up as many angles as we can. Hopefully, uh, we're looking. It's early for fish to run out of the lake, and they always get a little early push in the. It's mid-September, and what is it, like 20, it's the end of September. <clears throat> and so we're going to, we might find one, I doubt it. That's, you know, that's usually an October or November thing around here. But we always get a few pushes here and there, but they tend to move pretty quickly through the water. And so then we're going to just look for residents. To say, and I'll try to remember to explain, you know, there's a little difference on fish who spawn, where they set frequently. They'll set in slightly different areas, just a little bit further down or, or way at the top of stuff. And we'll, we'll try to get as many setups as that as we can. So we're going to float down here. We're on the lower Madison. What's the date today? 27th or 8th or something like that of September. Pretty nice out. Supposed to be about 60. Perfect overcast. So the only excuses that I should have after this, if I don't catch a fish, is this raging hangover that that thing in the back of the boat got me just <clears throat> it was nothing to do with me i was an innocent bystander so we just crossed underneath the bridge you can hear it right overhead we now are in the walk wade section so everything we do from this point on we have to do out of the boat so we'll get started here in a few minutes so because we're I do have the luxury of the boat. I brought extra boxes, so I was just pulling out of these boxes for what I wanted. And <clears throat> I pulled, so I just went in. I don't have many flies with me. I just brought basics. And so I, these are just storage boxes for the boat. So I pulled out because I'm going to be on foot and I'm not going to be walking back and forth to the boat. So. I just grabbed a really basic selection of stuff. I got two boxes with me. Just really basic envies, boogies. I got some single hook stuff, you know, really light loaded. I'm pretty sure I stole this gear bag from Job in 2000 years ago. This thing has got to be, <laughs> I don't know how old this thing is, but it ain't got much left in it. I want to show you one other thing that I thought about before I, when I was leaving. These wading boots, which are also about 200 years old. Um, <clears throat> this is a super simple trick, but I put these on when we got at the landing a half hour ago, <clears throat> and I didn't tighten them up. And after 40 some years of guiding, I can tell you, I've watched so many people do this. They get dry boots and they don't, and they cinch them down when they're dry. And it doesn't work very well. And so then they get to the river and they get wet and they loosen up. And again, these things, I don't know how old these boots are. If you wait, it's kind of like cinching down a horse. You don't cinch down your horse and just take off. You gotta let it work around it, let the air out of the thing. Same thing with your wading boots. Let them warm up, let them get wet. It makes it a lot easier putting them on. Makes it a lot easier tightening them down. Very basic. So I've got my pack. I'm gonna be running a 200 grain head today. It's a 200 grain. Get your shit out of the way, Swanee. I'm gonna be running a 200 grain, 30 foot head. I'm running a six weight. 
I'm not going to be using really big articulated stuff today. Earlier season gets a little later, I might be throwing a little bit more on. Um, on foot, especially when we get down below, this particular run is going to be a cross current run. So I'm going to be running slightly upstream, but more straight across. When I'm going upstream, and which we're going to do a lot because we have to weight everything, I don't necessarily like bigger flies. I don't like flies that have a lot of movement to their tails. If the water's too fast, they tend to push at me. So I tend to run flies that are a little less complex, that don't get their hind end pushed downstream, especially if the water's fast. But here it's going to be really simple. Uh, I'm going to hook up a new leader. So I'm going to rig up this leader like I did. I'm sure most of you know how I do this. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do a foot of 20 pound maxima. And I'm using the loop to loops. Uh, I'm just doing a perfection knot there. And I'm going to, I'm going to attach it like you would. You know, in the old days, we didn't do that. You know, about a foot of leader, about a foot of butt, I mean. In the old days, I wouldn't trust these things. This is a Airflow Streamer Max Long, 200 grain. When they first came out with these butt sections, man, I was, these loop-to-loops, I was super suspect because I'd had them break in the other, in some of the other companies. And all I've got with me is, is, is 20 and 12, so <clears throat> you'll see the leader. This is gonna be about two foot. That's just just whatever, you know, the yip much past three foot on your leader, and you kind of lose a little bit of what you're trying to do with the sinking line, keeping the fly in one depth. The fly line's gonna sink the fly, and if you get a really long leader, you get a fly way up above your line, and you know, our retrieves are so short, we're just not out there, and I'm gonna harp on that a lot about distance of cast because I just really prefer people to fish pretty tight. And on foot, I'm not as worried because you get to cover the water. If you're in a boat and you're moving, you, it takes about 11 seconds to do a complete pickup roll, pickup roll, cast, retrieve. Um, it takes about 11 seconds to do that. Like that knot should have taken about nine seconds, but I missed because something that happened last night. Six beers. Six beers runs down my chin. Okay, so that's that's my entire leader. So I'm doing loop to loop, about a foot, then about two foot up here. And again, you can change that up if you want. Some people like to go four feet. I don't know. They're, the whole idea that the fish is looking at the leader is such a crock. They you could tie to your fly line. They're they're going to eat this thing. The flies, even on a small streamer like that, they're more. They're locked on the fly. They're not locked on the uh, on the size of your leader. So that's the line. Like I said, it's an airflow. It's a uh, 200 long airflow streamer max. The rod is a. I'm using my rod, the Streamer X Echo Streamer X. This is a six weight. I tend to fish a lot of. I almost exclusively fish six weights on foot. Uh, I get. I have a real tendency to get tennis elbow especially later in the season when you've been throwing a lot of stuff and so the heavier rods just are a little harder to load just not much but just enough so you know can make that tennis elbow flare up but mostly on foot I'm seldom casting long enough to have to really get a bigger line and I'm usually not fishing big enough flies to carry it so I usually I get into sevens when I start looking at five inch flies and above I'm full on seven but anyway, it's a Streamer X. I'm using a Nautilus reel. I like these reels. I like the, it just, everybody has a preference on their reels. And I, you know, one thing I do poorly on my YouTube and on my other channels, I never ask people to hit the like button. I don't know why, I really wish you would. But I never do it. I always feel like I'm, I don't like to self promote the stuff, like one person's reel over another. I like to promote what I like about reels. And I love the Nautilus. Uh, I've been fishing it for a long time. Mostly, I like skinny, tall reels. They pick up line and hold it without coiling it much. I don't buy into drags so much. They've all got great drags nowadays. 
I use very little drag when I'm fighting fish. They're going to run the harder. The more you drag a fish, the more tendency it's going to have to go downstream, which is a kiss of death. So I don't, I don't really care about that. But, and again, short leader went over that, rod, nautilus reel. And again, mostly what I like is just the tall, I like the tall skinny reels. They pick up line very quick and they're really smooth on their exit. When the fish is running, there's very little, you know, when it gets stuck in the line. And again, like I said, I hardly ever say like this page. Really appreciate if you do. I don't know if I've ever said that. Most is because I don't want you to think I'm trying to sell product, but we really do appreciate it if you hit the like button and tell all your friends. Let's go fishing. Any fish in there has got to come off that bank and race out to get it. So I want it to hit, I want it to hit pretty hard. I want it to hit the surface pretty hard because I want, that's the telltale to the fish that something's there. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to splat that down pretty hard and tell any fish in there that something hit and it's running right at the tail out. He did exactly what you said, he followed it all the way out. So fast in there, I can't, he had to, he came off that bank quite a while. Just a little feller. He just got balls. <clears throat> oh, he pretty. Don't get prettier than that, buddy. Ah, uh, that's kind of a weird one. That uh, we were trying to fish that little short. The wind's howling down here. I was trying to fish that upper. We came down to this point. Braden told me he saw a fish here once with his dad that chased the fly like 10 feet out. I threw into that, trying to hit that soft bucket eight feet off from shore. And I saw the fish coming from behind it and it ate it right in the middle of that really, that just about eight feet off. You can see, we were talking about it earlier about it's kind of flattened out right there. It's sitting right, just came right off of it and hit it in that pretty shallow water. So that was on black. And I, I'm kind of moving, I'm encroaching on these things. First, the fish don't care too much. But secondly, if I stay back too far, when my line hits the water, if I stay way back here and I throw and I throw for this bank, right? And I throw it over there and I'm coming through, this surface current's catching 20 feet of my line and just nuking that fly out of there. So I'm trying to encroach on it so I have less, less line on the surface to get caught and change the angle of the fly and speed it up to a really unrealistic speed and so it just nukes out of there. So as you see, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get as close as I possibly can so I can control two or three feet of the, that initial spot where it hits because otherwise I'd get swept out of there really quick. We're gonna run over to this flat spot right out here. This water's pretty insignificant, but it is a little pushy. And I wanna show you something that I learned from reading the Bible of fishing, Joe Brooks Trout. If you wanna see something that's amazingly stable, put your rod in the water, don't push it down on the bottom, don't lean against it. Simply put your, water, your rod in the water like this, and if you, you'll be amazed, you're not, you're not leaning against it, but it's an incredible stabilizer. Obviously this water's not really that pushy, but if you get in water that's pushy, you don't have a staff, just drop your rod in there and barely, you know, you barely lean against it. It's not going down. You don't want the tip in the water. Always lean just a little bit upstream when you're crossing this stuff. So your toes are pointing up. And try not to fall in your face. That's the bad part. Single roll, pick up, drift, and return and you do not false cast sinking lines. You do it in one shot. If you've got a tight loop, you end up wearing it right here or right here in the back of your head, and it hurts, man. So, simple roll, 
drift, I like to slip a little line. And if you notice, I don't let go of my, my line with my um, retrieving hand. So I go drift and I go like that and I'm immediately in control of that line. One of the most common things you see people do wrong with a sinking line is they have a tendency to go here and then they go and they do that and that line swings around your rod. If it doesn't swing around, you're, you're throwing it. If it doesn't do that, it goes around like this and it's over here. So you want this, this hand, your left hand, you do your, you do your roll, drift, slide, and your haul, and you keep your, just keep your finger like that because one of the most important things to fish in a streamer is that fly hits the water. When I mean, when it hits, you want that fly to move. I don't care how far, but you don't want it to sit on the water while you screw around trying to get that line off your rod and it just floats, right? Those fish will see that fly. The second it hits the water, they feel it. They're gonna be there looking for it. They're gonna look. If it sits there and floats like a piece of moss or whatever crap on the top, they're not gonna hit it. So, simple in front. And when I, when I roll that in front, when you start down here, if you try to cast with your fly down there, when you pick up to cast, that flies over here. When you go forward, you're gonna wear it again. That's why you do a roll pickup. So the fly's down here, you get it into a manageable 10, 15 feet, bring it up like you would any other roll cast, hit it. The second it hits the water, you pick up. So it's coming from here, down below me. I come up, I roll it, pick it up instantly, drag and drift, boom, I'm out. It's that easy. And we're doing, we're doing 25 foot of water. You don't even feel it. Now we'll move over into the guts. When you look out there, when you look, I said earlier, when you look at water, especially on bigger rivers, it can look like the same, everything's the same. It is not the same. And what you're looking for is, get off of there. What you're looking for is anything that tells you where the bottom has flattened out so it's not so much incline. So we're standing in an incline. It's, the water's going downstream quickly for a reason. It's sloping down. When you see those little glassy plates like right there, that simply tells you that that water has flattened out. That's an easier spot for the fish to hold. You've got to learn to see those. They're very obvious when you've got something like this where it's, it's breaking it, but it's a lot harder to identify the ones out in the middle. When you talk to really great steelheaders, the difference between the really good and the average is simply their ability to read water where fish will hold. They don't look at the whole river as all the same water, and it's the same thing with trout. When you can read and know where the fish should be, you win. Because it doesn't matter what you fly, what fly you throw at them. If they're not there, they're not there. Can't eat what's not there. I frequently tell people I don't swing flies. The guy running the camera, Braden's a big steelhead guy, swing guy, and he does a lot of it in here. But I'm gonna still, I'm gonna break this down just like I was running steelhead if I was swinging. I'm simply gonna have an active retrieve as opposed to just letting the fly swing. I'm not a fan of swinging flies tail first. So I'm going at about a 15 degree and I'm slowing that jig down a little bit. I'm coming and a long angle across like this, and I'm moving the fly, I'm trying to keep it doing this, so it's going across, and I will simply step it out. I usually go about three to five feet on my next cast and do that two or three times, step down, but I keep that angle, and I keep coming across, so I'm sweeping the fly, coming at me head first. So that's a 200, it's probably sunk. That runs three, four foot deep. I don't really worry about fishing real deep on these things. If there's a, there's not gonna be a fish riding in that heavy current, I've gotta find those soft spots. And if that goes over that fish's head, he'll come, even if it's a foot over his head, that's plenty. That's what they're used to doing is they're ambushers. They're coming from the bottom. And so they're going to, that, that's not a problem getting them to move that far. 
I know there were people fishing this run already today. It's afternoon. But, and that's an experimental fly. It looked good. I like it. But I'd rather, I'd have more confidence with the fly. I know that I'm sure it'll fish. I'm just not. I'm going to switch over. I'm going to go to really the same style, same color fly. I'm going to do another olive, which usually I would change colors, but late. That's just an experiment. So I'm going to go to a peanut envy, bigger fly. This is a much. This is a little different profile as well. This is more of a leech style. I'm going to I'm going to run this on a slower jig. I have two retrieves I use almost exclusively. One's called the jerk strip, and I do that no matter what I'm doing, but the style will change when I go to a jig style, which I'll show you here in a second. It's just one's done horizontally and one's done vertical. And this, when I'm trying to move flies kind of halfway between really fast and really slow, I go off and I kind of go at a 40 degree angle. And so the jerk strip simply means I never use, I don't strip my line like this. I only move my rod tip and I strip against the soft. I don't ever get a groove here. I'm never stripping against my finger. I throw it out. It hits the water and I, I move it with my rod tip and I get a ton of animation that way. Everything I do with that rod tip moves that fly. And so if I want it, damn it, if I want to get an eat right there, if I want it to move really short, 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 I simply move it like that. If I want it to go long, like long pause, long, I just pull in a single pull. If I want it to go more up and down, now instead of going like this, I just simply lift the rod up a little bit more like that. So it brings the line up from the bottom. Today I'm going to probably mostly do a cross between those two. Oh, did he jump? Did he jump that? Run, buddy. Rain butt. Stop that. Hmm? Yes. Nice one. Fished up that thing. He came off the bank. He came right off. You could see he spun around. But we've been fishing dark all morning. Just started with white. Decided to go back to. I, it happens to everybody. You get the idea that you should be doing something. So I went olive, olive, black, got fish, stay with black. Went back to olive, went to white, boom, got fish. Should have done it earlier. But it is lightening up. It's also, that's part of it too. It just lightened up a little bit. And what was the problem with that last fish you got? What was the problem? Yeah. It was a rainbow. Why is that a problem? Non-game species. <laughs> that's pretty obvious. There's just this thing about brown trout being it goes back, way back in fishing lore. Ray Bergman, Joe Brooks, people like that. They've always touted the brown trout as the wiliest of all trout. So it gets this somewhat mythical reputation for being smart, which they can be. And <clears throat> it's like anything else, you know? It's just, they're, they seem harder to catch, but in all fairness, 
a 20 plus rainbow is just as hard to catch as a 20 plus brown. And their juvenile behavior, when they're under 18 inches, the rainbows are far easier to catch than a brown trout. But most of that comes from stocking. If you get a wild rainbow and a wild brown trout, they're pretty damn even. And it's mostly tongue in cheek. But if I had a river full of rainbows and a river full of brown trout, I'd probably never see the river full of rainbows. <laughs> These convergent seams like this, we got three speeds coming into here and we're running into this little short dump. This is a, uh, we're trying to get upstream here, but my assumption is they're gonna be hanging right on that bank and they're not gonna to wanna to hang in that drop right there. But I would think I'd have juvenile fish there eating, setting up for bug eating and stuff like that. But not so much real fish. Oh, camera guy. I would have got, did you see it? No. I didn't. <laughs> oh, I would have clobbered you. As I was saying, should be right on that. I didn't want to. Yeah, he, he, uh, I didn't actually see what kind of fish it was. It rolled the, uh, it thumped it and it just rolled over. So you see me pausing that and starting and stopping it? What I'm doing is I'm, I'm pulling that, I'm going really close to shore, and then I'm, I'm fishing right fast, and then I, there's a, a, a bucket right there, and as I get close to it, I want the fly to be going like this, and I want it to kind of stall. I don't want it to, I seldom want to run the fly constantly one way, right? So I'm twitching the fly, and then as it got to that soft spot, I was letting it kind of roll, not completely dead drift, but just enough. And that's, when I did that, that last time, when it went off, that's probably the only fish there. But when I, when I did that stall, I, when I went to hit, I was going to hit Braden in the head, so I didn't hit. But it ate it on the pause. And that's very common if you're, you're trying to emulate a wounded or screwed up fish. And you... One of the reasons that I fish, the method that I do with my retrieve, is that you, pre, you, you know, we like to pretend we're fishing something that's got an injury. And so if the only retrieve you have in your arsenal is to throw it out there and do this, it's kind of hard to do anything but that. You can't do over, you know, you, you can do that, I suppose, but it gets really complicated. When you do it with your rod tip, it is just so easy to just fast, 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 pause, fast, big pull, pause, you can do all kinds of stuff. It's just more, it's a little bit more efficient. It gives you another, another arrow in the quiver. And you're never out of position. You're always ready to hit. Well, we covered a lot of material there. We covered a lot, not a lot of water. We fished for about two, two and a half hours. Got two nice fish. Kind of a weird day. The sun's on and off, high clouds. Uh, but it worked out. We went through the color changes, showed you some angles, different places how we were, we were fishing it. The river's pretty skinny right now, so we were kind of limited to a, not a lot of water, but we had enough. Like I said, it was a good day. Only spent a little time and hope you got something out of it. Anybody can do it. Just get out there and try. Thanks for watching.